Today I'll be talking about uh, health disparities in autism spectrum disorder. But before I do that, I want to declare some conflicts of interest. Um, as it was just mentioned, I'm, uh, I am the CEO of a, of a startup company called Linus Biotechnology, which is a spin out of my lab at Mount Sinai. I'm actually very proud of this slide. Uh, these conflicts of interest are actually something I wear as a badge of honor for two reasons. One is it has allowed me to give back to the taxpayer something very tangible. And uh, for the second reason, which I'll discuss right uh, at the end of my talk, it's my very last slide. Now, everyone here is involved in health research, health care, so you, you probably know what autism spectrum disorder is. Uh, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, children suffer from impaired social communication, sometimes repetitive behavior. You would have heard of this. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, is that any better? Yeah. Good. Sorry. Okay. Um, so autism spectrum disorder, right? Uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, um, and uh, children are, are struggling to develop social relationships, struggling to communicate, language delays, repetitive behavior. Sometimes they're hypersensitive. Um, there's a specific definition, but I'm not going to go into that. You can see this child here, instead of playing with toys, they're just organizing them in, in a sequence. One of the surprising facts about autism is that in each round of the CDC survey, we see that the prevalence is going up. Now, around the time I was born, it was one in 10,000, but now it's one in 36. So what's going on? Some of this is just, we're more aware of it. So we are looking for it, we are detecting it. But there's a real increase as well. And we can't just assign it all to genetics. In fact, I assign this increase very, very little of it to genetics uh, because our genome hasn't changed that much since at least since I was born. So it must be driven by non-genomic exposomic factors. Given that we are here, I just wanted to share some local data with you. So the national prevalence is about 3%. Tennessee is right, uh, right about there. Uh, California has a much higher prevalence, and we can talk about that later. But since I'm starting a bit late, I'm going to, going to rush through those uh, through a few slides. Thinking about disparity, disparities by race, you see that uh, black children and Hispanic children have higher rates than white children. In fact, this is actually a, a good trend, and I'll, I'll tell you why that that's uh, why I'm saying that. Because historically, black and Hispanic children were thought to have about the same rates as white children, but they were consistently underdiagnosed. Over the past five, six years, more efforts have been placed, more resources have been as assigned to impoverished communities uh, so that they can access diagnosis. So many states now allow through mandate insurance to cover autism diagnosis and some form of early intervention. But this is where the story starts to turn. There's one thing getting a diagnosis with autism spectrum disorder, access to treatment, the start of the, the good part of the story, not just the, the bad news that you have this condition, um, you still see stark differences. So this comes from the, the civil rights database, which is a very large database, and they split uh, their analysis into two communities. Metropolitan, which by their statistical unit is a, a community of more than 50,000 residents, and then Micropolitan, which is less than 50,000. So here again you see that access to care, which they've broken down into a statistical unit. This includes things like access to ABA therapy, for example. It's lower in black and Hispanic communities compared to white and Asian communities. This picture gets much worse if you live in a micropolitan area, an area which is small, which has fewer residents and therefore fewer resources, this disparity just becomes even bigger. But here's the thing, when I first jumped into this area of research and then started developing biomarkers, this all seemed rather bizarre because none of this seems like good news, not even for the white children who have so much better access to care than black children. Because in all of this, the biology was completely ignored. I just want to remind you of a few very basic and oversimplified facts about brain development. All the things that I mentioned when I said this is autism, language, you know, uh, social development, vision, hearing, making eye contact, 
when is our brain, when are we learning to do that in the first year of life? When are we diagnosing autism as an entire nation? Around four to four and a half years. And that median age of diagnosis is consistently stubborn. In repeated surveys, even as prevalence is going up, we are struggling to diagnose children early enough. So what's the point of diagnosing somebody at four and starting therapy at four when the key areas of your brain that can respond to therapy are all really waiting for that therapy around one year of age or even earlier? Seems like an obvious thing to say, but early intervention only works when it's early. And this definition of early <laughs> is not four years of age, right? I like to make this joke like it's in the name. It's right there in the title, early intervention. And it's just not me saying this, no, and it's like, it's been shown that months can make a difference. This paper on top just came out recently. They said if you start therapy at 18 months versus 27 months, the 18 month year olds do better than even 27 month year olds. And we are diagnosing at four years. But they cobble these studies together. They find children whose older siblings have autism. They're painful studies. That study has a sample size of 80 and probably cost millions of dollars to do. So this is not something we can roll out as a public health policy. Another study showed that after six years of follow-up, a six-week uh, program of training or therapy still had measurable impact. So therapy works and the impacts last. It's not a cure, but it certainly does help in improving. So let me bring some of environmental medicine and precision environmental medicine into this. Most of the efforts in autism have been through genetics and they haven't yielded a biomarker. I've always said you can scan a newborn baby with every genomic technology and you have almost no predictive power whether that baby will go on to develop autism or not because the E component in precision medicine has been missing. Listening to uh, the keynote speaker this morning, I'm feeling a bit embarrassed as sharing this slide because in the last four years, I've only published one book and I think it was 18 books. It's okay, it's okay. I'm, I'm catching up. I was 18 books behind, now I'm 17 books behind. I'm catching up. So far, I have a perfect five-star rating from the three people who bought it on Amazon, so please, please don't mess it up, all right? The idea behind this newer concept of environmental biodynamics is that rather than just measure many, many things, we need to measure many, many times because our body is dynamic. Unlike our genome, which is sort of our base sequence is static with some epigenetic changes, we want to measure our physiology at a very deep resolution. But it turns out we need about 500 to 1,000 time points. Now, I'm guessing none of you, even though you're health professionals, you will volunteer for studies, you wouldn't be walking around with 500 to 1,000 blood samples banked in some fridge. It's just not possible. And that translates into a real problem, these black boxes that we end up having in any study on health. So imagine if you took two blood samples, and I'll just be clear that these are just dots I've put here to convey a point. You don't know what happened between them. So we assume that, well, for this one toxic exposure, because the two dots are, you know, haven't moved upwards on the y-axis, things haven't changed. We developed this technology. I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail. From a single strand of hair, we can measure at two to four hourly resolution hundreds of time points. I'm going to show you data where we have, where we have gone back 2,000 time points over two years. And before anybody says anything, the irony that I'm working on here is not lost on me, so please keep your humor to yourself. This is actual data, and this was supplied from the California fires. This person had experienced fires about over a year before we collected the hair sample, and we can see how over time it's not a flat profile. In fact, there's detailed patterns in there. And using machine learning, we've learned to extract those patterns. And what we found is that there are specific patterns for autism and other conditions that we often confuse for autism. So, all right, we have this scientific theoretical basis and now we've got this technology. I'm gonna move very quickly to show you how we have developed a, a tool 
that I think is ready for clinical use. But you decide for yourself. The question you should be asking yourself now is when is the science good enough? When is the science good enough that we should release it and say patients will benefit from this? I started my first studies um, on twins because there is a heritable component to autism. So this is a standard twin design. I, I won't go into too much detail. But what we found immediately was even in a twin analysis where one twin develops autism and the other one does not, there's a period just before birth, minus 10 weeks to plus four weeks, where zinc levels started dropping. In fact, there was dysregulation of many elements. I'm just showing zinc. Now, if you did a blood sample out here, you wouldn't see a difference. If someone took a, this was on teeth samples, if someone took a whole tooth and just analyzed them, you wouldn't see this. This, this, this difference, because this difference only exists in the time dimension. So without measuring many, many times, you could measure as many things as you want, as many chemicals, you wouldn't see this difference. But, you know, I'm not going to believe one study done on a bunch of Swedish twins. So I wanted to replicate this, and we replicated this in New York, we went to Texas and replicated it there. In New York, they were still siblings, not twins. In Texas, just a population, uh, unrelated populations. And then we went to the UK and, and recruited children who were born two decades earlier, in 1990. Still the same pattern. Pooled it all together, and it, it, it holds. But this is when it struck me, this is a great research tool. It doesn't help our patients. Why? Teeth shed out around the age of five. When does the brain, when is the brain hungry for that therapy? The age of one. That's why I introduced the hair biomarker, because here you can collect it any time from most people. <laughs> so we did this study where we started a prospective study in Japan, recruited pregnant women, they had babies, some of them would go on to develop autism, but we tested the newborn hair and just waited. Four years later, they got their DSM-5 diagnosis, we could compare it to them. We went and replicated this in Sweden. And then we replicated it again at Mount Sinai, and this is a study on about 500 children. This is the published ROC. This is a pretty decent looking ROC. However, since we published this almost two years ago now, one and a half years ago, it's improved a whole lot. Our PPV and our NPV are both above 0.9 as a screening tool. So we are doing much better than this, but since I haven't published it, uh, I'm not showing that. But we wanted to correlate this novel biomarker to other technologies that have also shown consistent differences. Those who are familiar with MRI literature, children, autistic children have certain characteristic MRI, structural MRI features, and we showed that our, our hair biomarker can distinguish those features. A clinical you know, interpretation of this is, well, you don't need to put an autistic child in that MRI machine, which is difficult and expensive and time consuming. The hair biomarker can also do that or give you the information you need. The other thing is, if it is a good biomarker for a disease, it's not just separating it from controls, it's separating it from the next nearest disease. And we picked ADHD because often this can coexist or it gets confused in early ages. Autism can be misdiagnosed as ADHD. And here you see that we can cluster them out. We are working in many other areas, and I'll, be, you know, I'll go quickly, that some children have mitochondrial dysfunction. This has been linked to a regressive type of autism where children actually regress, they lose language, they lose many aspects of their personality, which is a very traumatic event. So, back to that question that I asked you to keep in mind. When is the science good enough? For me, we've replicated this in four countries in two completely different tissues, teeth and hair, using the same idea from that very good book that has a perfect rating on Amazon. <laughs> and for me, it was still, I need someone else to provide diligence. So I went to the FDA and I said, hey, you know, you decide what is good science or not. And they gave us what's called breakthrough designation. For the first time ever, any technology that can detect autism at birth up to 21 years. And because I have a company, I can also start working on treatment sites. So we are looking at certain nutraceuticals along with this company, Novozymes, and, and we are working with them to develop or test things that may eventually help, not there yet. 
personally for me, the science is good enough, yes, for patients. However, the real answer is, will this biomarker help reduce those disparities in access to healthcare that I showed that really exist in those micropolitan communities where black and brown children are just not getting access to care, existing care, even if they're diagnosed at four years of age. I'm not allowed to name certain things, but this is what I'm very proud of. This is why I said, I'll tell you in the last slide why I'm very proud of this conflict of interest. As the CEO of a company whose you know, ethics and, and core beliefs are very much in an academic, uh, not-for-profit um, upbringing, we just are close to finishing a deal with a state in the South, a state which is mostly low-income folks, that has just one center for diagnosis. The waiting list there is two years long. For treatment, you have another waiting list. People drive hours to get there, and the sad reality is that 70% of the kids on that waiting list actually don't have autism. Prevalence is 3%, right? Most of your people on that waiting list actually have just waited two years, but they have something else. They're gonna end up on a different wait list. So what we are doing is we are partnering with them where we will deliver an answer at home. We send out a little kit, you just clip hair, send it back to us, and for every test that they can afford, we will give three for free. Because they said 70% of our patients are on Medicaid. So you do the number, I said, yes, you can really only afford one test for every four people who need it. And that's why I'm so proud of that conflict of interest slide, because we are actually going to impact health disparities. I'll stop there. I just want to uh, thank all the people on, on here. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. <laughs>